This program is brought to you by RTS on iTunes U from the Distance Education Department of Reformed Theological Seminary. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920. Let's look a little bit at uh, Ritchell's thought, his view of uh, um, theology beginning with epistemology, uh, historical scholarship. Uh, Ritchell seeks to base his theology upon an autonomous historical analysis of Jesus' life and teaching, the quest of the historical Jesus. As a historical scholar, Ritchell is critical of the biblical record, but somewhat more conservative than earlier scholars like F.C. Bauer and David Strauss. By the way, Strauss should have two S's. Uh, Ritchell proposes earlier dates than they did for New Testament materials, the Gospels, for example. And uh, Ritchell opposes the idea of a Hegelian dialectic a conflict within the apostolic circle uh, between the Peter and Paul and Luke and so on. Um, Ritchell says the main conflict is between the apostles and the Judaizers, and here Ritchell is right. Uh, Ritchell, however, uh, is seeking a ground of certainty that's more ultimate than what can be found in, a, in historical scholarship. Um, Ritchell sounds as though he's disagreeing with Lessing. That the, he, he's saying that you, you really can get values out of, uh, out of you, you really can get truth out of uh, history. And that this big ditch just doesn't exist anymore. Um, history and faith. But actually, uh, Ritchell turns out, if you look at him more carefully, Ritchell turns out that he agrees with Lessing. What Ritchell is looking for when he performs the quest of the historical Jesus, what Ritchell is looking for in his historical studies is not the actual Jesus, the ground of faith. What he's looking for are value judgments. And it's, from, it's the value judgment from which comes faith. You see, you go back and you study history, and you study Jesus, and you study the life of Jesus and the life of the early church. And then you say, what do I think of that? How do I evaluate Jesus? How do I evaluate Paul? I, I, I like this, I don't like that. You know, you come up with a number of, of judgments. And that's where you get your faith. That's where you get your theology. So it's not from the history of, itself, uh, itself. It's from your own evaluations of the history. It's from your own value judgments. So knowledge of God is not a knowledge of historical facts. Uh, it, it's a knowledge of the values discerned in these facts. The values are chiefly ethical, but not only so. Ritchell sees them as aspects of reality. So the knowledge of God, then, is a knowledge of value judgments evoked by revelation. And we study history to find its value for our lives. Theology, therefore, is practical, not theoretical. Ritchell says all theological propositions have for their aim the explanation of the phenomena of the Christian life. We cannot know things in themselves, but only as they are connected with us. A little bit of Kant coming in there. Uh, and the theoretical practical distinction is also reminiscent of Kant. But uh, Ritchell, unlike Kant, believes that you can develop a theory of the laws of the spiritual life, and he goes into that in some detail. The doctrine of God. God does not exist in himself, but only in connection with us. See, God is a practical concept. Remember how Kant, I'm sorry, yeah, remember how Kant said that God is not a constitutive concept, but a regulative concept. 
when I say I believe in God, I'm not saying that there is this metaphysical being called God who really exists in the numeral world. Rather, what I'm saying is I choose the concept of God by which to regulate my life. So God is a practical idea, not a, a metaphysical idea. And, and ritual kind of follows Kant in that respect. Uh, God then becomes the fundamental principle of nature and morality. His character is love for all men. Is he personal? Yes, because spirit is prior to nature. Divine personality is understood by means of our own, but God lacks the restraints that we have to contend with. Man and sin, ritual assumes that moral life is always an individual achievement Therefore, there is no independence or in, imputation, sorry, of righteousness or of sin. Imputation abstracts from the subject who produces it. Now, we saw something like this in Schleiermacher, too. Schleiermacher says that sin is never something that can come to us from the outside. It's always an individual moral failure. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's not sin. Uh, same thing for goodness. Goodness is always something that comes from within us, so it can never come from somebody else. It can never be given uh, from outside ourselves. Sin is not a legal category. Sin is not a transgression of law. Remember, Schleiermacher said that too. Uh, but uh, Ritual generalizes. Ritual says that because God is love, he is not law. There's a conflict between love and law. God can be law, but he, he's love, and he can't be both love and law, right? Uh, our, our relationship to him has to be a relationship of love, not a relationship of law, okay? I think the Bible says that it's both. Uh, what is sin? Well, sin is an abuse of freedom, says Ritual. It disrupts. Uh, the proper relationship between freedom and moral value, um, ignorance. Now, Christ, important, uh, what's important about Christ is not his nature. You start talking about the divine nature and the human nature and the divinity and the humanity, you're talking philosophy. And Ritual is not interested in philosophy. Ritual is interested in the value of Christ for me. A doctrine of Christ must show how he can make me morally better. So we know him by knowing what he does for us. And he's against any doctrines of Christ that are derived from Greek metaphysics, his pre-existence, his eternal equality with God, because these have no practical value for us. When we say that Christ is God, when we speak about the deity of Christ, rightly understood, this is an ethical Judgment. Christ receives the title God because he's been supremely faithful to the task given to him by God. And we confess his deity because of his unique value for us. He is a man whom we value as God. So therefore, because this value comes from our heart, something that we really uh, take seriously, his saving work becomes all the more valuable. His righteousness is not guaranteed by metaphysical deity. Uh, Jesus is a man like us. He had to struggle to maintain his righteousness from moment to moment. And so therefore, we can imitate him. His struggle is like our struggle. Um, and we are, again, capable of becoming like Christ. Uh, so again, uh, here's another theologian who denies the traditional idea of Jesus' deity uh, so that uh, he can have something more in common with us. The resurrection, he says, historically dubious, soteriologically unimportant. Salvation is the actualization of the potential for moral improvement in all men. Okay, for, for Kant, uh, salvation is, is when you have this moral ideal within you and you're trying to actualize it, make it more mature. For Schleiermacher, you have this God consciousness within you and you're trying to make it more mature. And now for Ritual, 
Uh, you have this potential for moral improvement, probably not much different from what Kant was saying, and you want to make that more mature. Christ uh, sacrificed himself for his community, but this is not the source of our salvation. Our faith is directed not to Jesus' past, but to his present as he is with us to help us in, in our moral improvement. And so uh, ritual polemicizes against the orthodox view of Jesus' atonement as a sacrifice for sin. That's external. That's legal, okay? Uh, and the idea that Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us, that's nonsense because there, we can't have any righteousness except what we ourselves do through our choices and through our actions. But nevertheless... Uh, what we do, we do because we're taken up into God's love. And that's sort of what imputation really means. I mean, God is helping us to achieve moral uh, maturity. Universalism, yes, because God is most fundamentally love for all of us and because human nature and human personality is one. Now, the older liberalism... Uh, we use that phrase uh, uh, <clears throat> to contrast the older liberalism with uh, the teaching later on of Karl Barth and uh, Emil Brunner and Rudolf Bultmann, uh, who are sometimes called neo-orthodox, uh, but are actually a, a, f a newer form of liberalism. So uh, the older form of liberalism, uh, the old modernism that's sometimes called um, Ritual and his disciples. Ritual developed a school of thought uh, of his of his disciples, and uh, I want to. Uh, we, we just barely mentioned uh, the first disciple last time, who is on page seventy three of your syllabus, Wilhelm Hermann. Uh, you notice his dates eighteen forty six to nineteen twenty two. So we're actually getting into the 20th century here, and we'll be in the 20th century for the rest of this course. Notice how I'm, I'm structuring everything, I'm wading everything into the modern period. Well, page 74, Wilhelm Hermann is, is the teacher of both Bart and Bultmann. Uh, now, both Bart and Bultmann, whom we'll talk about later, but both of them rebelled against Hermann in many ways, but uh, his positive influence upon both is quite discernible, even in the development of their distinctive views. Hermann was always talking about the personalism of theology, the personality of God, the personality of Jesus, the personal relationship that we have. And this is uh, a predecessor of what uh, uh, Emil Brunner called uh, personalism, uh, Emil Brunner's uh, emphasis on uh, personal encounter uh, between man and God and uh, the existentialist theologies of the late uh, 20th century. Now, one interesting thing about Hermann is that one of his students was J. Gresham Machen. Now, you've probably heard that name somewhere before, but uh, here at RTS, we, we owe a great debt to J. Gresham Machen. Uh, J. Gresham Machen was uh, uh, a professor at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary back when Princeton was an Orthodox Reformed uh, seminary. And uh, J. Gresham Machen wrote the very important book called Christianity and Liberalism. He is a substantial scholar, wrote a number of, uh, uh, wrote a book on the virgin birth, wrote a book on Paul's religion. But uh, his most famous book is this book called Christianity and Liberalism, which is a very weighty and substantive critique of the older liberalism of uh, Ritchell and Hermann and Harnack and people like that. It's a wonderful book, and if you want to uh, have any understanding at all of uh, theology, even today, even in the 21st century, you really need to read Machen's book. You really need to read Christianity and Liberalism. Well, one of the reasons why this is such a great book 
is that Machen actually knew these guys firsthand. Uh, some of us, uh, you know, when we're writing about uh, uh, liberalism, when we're writing about views that we disagree with, uh, we create straw men. Uh, we we do uh, we expound their views in ways that uh, haven't been very well researched. Uh, Machen was not like that. Machen actually studied in Germany uh, with a number of these uh, uh, Richlians, with a number of these liberals, and his favorite professor when he studied in Germany was uh, uh, Wilhelm Hermann, and. Uh, he wrote home to his mother uh, these glowing pictures of, uh, of Hermann. He said, uh, uh, described Hermann as a man of deep religious feeling, contagious earnestness. And he said, if ever a man was devoted to Christ, it was Hermann. Now, shortly, uh, actually, Machen went through sort of a crisis of faith at that time. He wasn't sure where he is going to end up theologically. Uh, he came back and, and began teaching at Princeton, uh, mainly teaching Greek and stuff like that. Uh, still kind of unsure as to whether he uh, uh, would uh, follow Princeton's generally orthodox theology. And I think it's kind of remarkable that uh, Princeton was willing to, to let him teach, even though he wasn't uh, entirely sure of his theology back in those days. But eventually, uh, uh, Machen decisively rejected Hermann, and he embraced the uh, orthodox uh, Reformed theology of uh, old Princeton and defended it very powerfully. But his defense was all the more powerful because he had sat under the teaching of Hermann. When you read uh, Machen talking about the liberals, He's not constructing a straw man. He actually knows what he's talking about. He's read extensively in these books, although his, his, his book, uh, Christianity and Liberalism, is not full of a lot of scholarly footnotes and citations and so on, but, uh, but he just speaks very, very honestly and earnestly from the standpoint of his knowledge and warns the church against the liberalism of, uh, of uh, Hermann. Well, uh, so it's the struggle of, with liberalism at its best, liberalism in its best formulations, uh, liberalism at its most attractive, that makes uh, Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism, such a cogent critique. Well, let's talk a little bit about what uh, uh, Hermann was about. Uh, Hermann, uh, again, a, very much a personalist, and... Uh, He's always interested in how, uh, the, the, how the Christian faith affects me, affects the believer. Uh, what does it do for me here and now? And so his doctrine of revelation is that revelation is only that which serves as a foundation for my faith. See, he rejects the idea that revelation is just out there somewhere and that it's some objective thing that we plug into uh, to reveal is to make something known to a person, okay? And uh, so there's no revelation unless it's revelation for me. Now, that may sound dreadfully subjective, but uh, understand that uh, there, there is a biblical basis for this. Uh, uh, Jesus says in Matthew 11, uh, no one knows the Father except the Son, and to whomever the Son chooses to reveal him. Now there the word revelation is a, is a personal transaction. It's talking about uh, making God known to somebody uh, uh, in, in the mind and in the heart. And sometimes revelation has that subjective meaning in Scripture. Not always. I think sometimes in Scripture... Revelation is an objective uh, reality, uh, which uh, remains revelation even if you deny it, even if you don't accept it, even if it has no effect on your heart whatsoever. But uh, this, this is, uh, Hermann uh, kind of leaves that out of the picture. Uh, Hermann kind of leaves aside 
the idea of an objective revelation, and he believes that revelation is not revelation unless it's revelation to a person, to a subject. Now, that's a kind of new concept of revelation. I think uh, we'll see that Kierkegaard would agree with it, and many 20th century people agree with it. Uh, Karl Barth uh, agrees with it. Uh, Rudolf Bultmann, just about everybody writing in the 20th century has that kind of subjective view of revelation. And uh, I sometimes call that the subjective turn. That's the subjective uh, uh, push to understand revelation that way. And you see what it is. It's an escape from Lessing's ditch. Lessing says that uh, uh, objective history cannot uh, be a basis for my faith today. Well, what is a basis for my faith today? Says Hermann, it's revelation coming to me now. Not revelation in the distant past, but revelation coming to me now. So, uh, revelation is only that which serves as a foundation of my faith. Therefore, faith is not based on any historical judgment. It's not based on my historical scholarship. It's not based on my judgment of, of when Jesus lived and what he did and, and what uh, events transpired. Uh, faith is something in the present. Mere history, he says, passes into the past, leaving us with a Christ who is no different from other historical figures. See, that's Lessing again. You can't, uh, uh, you, you, uh, Christ, if Christ is a past uh, individual, uh, he's no more significant than any, any other past individual, like Julius Caesar, uh, for example. Uh, faith is based on a present reality, an experience in which we apprehend Christ as immediately as did the first disciples. Okay? God is still at work. Now, there's some truth in this. You know, we, we say, uh, you know, you can't trust in Christ unless the Holy Spirit is present. Okay, regenerating you, renewing your mind, illuminating your thought. So we, we believe, uh, the Reformed faith believes, that there's a present dimension uh, to this. But uh, in Reformed theology, the present dimension is always dependent on something that happened in the past, Jesus' crucifixion, the uh, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Uh, the Spirit bears witness to that. But uh, uh, that's not what uh, Harnack is saying. Harnack is saying that these events in the past are relatively dispensable, uh, while the, uh, uh, the, the thing that is really crucial is what is happening in the present day. So, uh, but nevertheless, he says, we are concerned with history, and he's critical of Schleiermacher for not being sufficiently concerned with history. Why? Because we want to know a little bit about the historical Jesus, Mainly, we want to understand the inner life of Jesus. We want to understand Jesus' faith. We want to understand how Jesus lived before God as a model of our own present faith. Well, okay, together with Revelation, we usually talk about Scripture. What about Scripture? Hermann says, the words of others cannot be revelation to me unless I accept them in faith. No revelation without faith, okay? No revelation without personal encounter in the present, all right? So uh, Scripture is an interesting book, but it can't be revelation unless it has a present effect on me, and that's Bart's view as well. Uh, in rejecting this principle, orthodoxy warrants only intellectual assent, not true faith in which Christ is apprehended directly. Hermann says, if you're orthodox, like the traditional view, like uh, Luther and Calvin and the post-Reformation uh, scholastics and so on, if you hold this traditional uh, kind of view, uh, then uh, you're, you're not basing your, your faith on uh, anything present. You're not... Uh, um, you're just giving your intellectual assent. It's just a matter of research. Uh, it's not a matter of real faith, because real faith 
occurs in the present time. Uh, real faith is a, is a direct uh, apprehension of Jesus Christ. Scripture gives uh, probable evidence concerning the history of Jesus, but not certainty. Reading Scripture can bring Jesus close to us. Without Scripture, there can be no encounter between us and Jesus. So Scripture is important, uh, and it's sort of the means by which God gets through to us in the present. It's a little bit like Bard, who says that Scripture is a witness and instrument, a uh, uh, tool of the Holy Spirit to change us in the present. What is uh, Hermann's concept of God? For Hermann, God is a religious concept, not a cognitive concept. When you confess faith in God, that's a religious confession. That's not saying that there's some metaphysical being uh, somewhere. Uh, God is paradoxical. He's hidden, but he's near. Uh, we have an inner confidence in God that resolves apparent contradictions. But uh, Hermann won't accept that what he believes is a real contradiction. Uh, we cannot be uh, resolved. Uh, we, we can't resolve logical problems through our inner confidence. But uh, there's no contradiction, he thinks, between God's nature and personality, his nature and work. And he says that God is found not in nature, but in history, uh, but of course uh, also in this present relationship that we have with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'll, I'll go through the rest of this more quickly. Uh, his doctrine of man, he emphasizes the unity of man and the, the uh, 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 the freedom of man's personality. Uh, under the doctrine of Christ, we know that Jesus existed by the fact of his influence, but that is not sufficient as a basis for faith. What about the resurrection? Well, the resurrection, again, is just a historical event uh, that may or may not have happened. There's no way of knowing what actually happened. But we do know that uh, whatever happened, it, it created faith in the disciples and gave birth to the church, and that same faith is available to us today. Exaltation, the important thing is that the early church somehow came to believe that salvation on earth uh, could be consummated. Uh, but the most important thing about the historical Jesus is his inner life as a model for our faith today. So he had a present relationship with God, and we should be like him. We, sh we should have a present relationship with God in that sense. The church enables us to actually feel uh, this impact. Well, you, you see, uh, uh, Hermann is... is uh, a, very much a disciple of ritual. We see a lot of similarities between his thought and the thought of ritual, but he kind of skews it in a more subjective direction. Uh, he's a rationalist and that he believes that uh, uh, our uh, uh, faith has to be subject to our reason. We should not uh, change our principles of historical scholarship in order to please our faith. Uh, historical scholarship should proceed to according to reason alone, uh, but then the irrationalism, our faith in God, is completely apart from uh, rational historic study. So um, you can read on through those comments under G. Again, notice the conservative drift, uh, powerful rhetoric against mere formalism, intellectualism, um, people who uh, make God a mere intellectual uh, object, but don't uh, see him as a real person. Well, you can imagine, uh, uh, you know, making a lot of uh, hay uh, out of that rhetoric in your sermons and so on. Uh, let's move on to Adolf Harnack, another disciple of Ritual, uh, and you see his dates were up to 1930 now. Uh, Harnack, very important figure at the beginning of the 20th century, leading New Testament scholar and church historian, made a lot of uh, uh, made a lot of uh, discoveries. 
uh, again, uh, very influential upon Barth and Bultmann. And he wrote uh, an influential popular treatment of liberalism called What is Christianity? Actually, in German, it was Das Wesen's, uh, uh, Wesen, Das Christentum, uh, the essence of Christianity, uh, the nature of Christianity. What that was is that uh, Harnack was a very famous scholar, probably the most famous uh, biblical scholar of his time, and at some point, uh, people uh, asked the question, well, Professor Harnack, what, what do you really believe about God? What do you really believe about Jesus? And Harnack, you know, would say, well, my business is scholarship, and uh, I'm not all that uh, uh, eager to share my faith. Uh, uh, he uh, seemed to be a little bit conservative at points. Uh, again, we see the conservative drift. He took a somewhat more conservative view, for example, of the dating of the New Testament books. Uh, he had a high regard for the uh, uh, historical accuracy of Luke, for example. Uh, so people sort of wondered, well, uh, Harnack maybe uh, has a, a conservative kind of faith, traditional kind of faith. But uh, Harnack uh, finally, at a late point in his life, uh, decided to give a, a, a series of lectures on what he thought Christianity was and uh, basically what he believed uh, based on all the scholarship that he had uh, gone through. These lectures were scheduled for very early in the morning, but uh, uh, it was impossible to get into the classroom. Uh, they were so popular and everybody wanted to hear what this great man had to say. And uh, so... Uh, we, we uh, will talk a little bit about him based on the book, uh, What is Christianity, in English. He says, uh, under history and faith, he says, historical criticism is necessary to separate the kernel from the husk in Scripture. Uh, he believes that, there, that some things in Scripture are historically true. Again, he has somewhat more conservative views on that, but there are other things that are legendary or mythical and uh, uh, built up uh, uh, by uh, well-meaning people who didn't care too much about the truth. Um, but anyway, uh, that's, that's his general view of uh, biblical scholarship. Faith, he says, is not based on historical events. Now that's Lessing, and that's Ritual, and that's Hermann, okay? Faith is not based on historical events. Religious truth is not discoverable through sensation. All right? So uh, Harnack does not believe in an empirical basis for uh, Christian faith. One reason, of course, is that uh, history is uh, uh, implicitly uncertain. But... Uh, he tries to come up with a theological rationale of this. And we're, we're going to see more and more that uh, uh, in liberal theology, they don't just want to say, well, I can't believe this anymore. Uh, but they try to come up with a theological reason why we shouldn't believe in the traditional way. And what he says is that faith, the nature of faith is to affirm God against uh, the world, that is to affirm God against the scholarly evidence and so on. There's something paradoxical about faith. So we don't expect historical scholarship to validate our faith for us. Uh, our faith ought to go against all of that. Nor can faith be based on some future eschatological expectation concerning the external world. Uh, Apparently, the early disciples thought that Jesus was coming soon. Uh, you can argue about that, but uh, uh, what difference does it make? I mean, faith is uh, focused on the present. Faith is not based on the past. Faith is not based on the future. Uh, faith is something that is based on the here and now. It's an attitude we take toward the here and now, very much like uh, Hermann in that respect. The truths of faith are timeless truths, and we'll get to get to those truths in a moment. Faith, then, is practical, not theoretical. 
Uh, faith has no interest in philosophical concepts of orthodoxy derived from Greek philosophy. Now, the Ritzelians, uh, Ritzel, Hermann, and Harnack, were very uh, critical of the role that Greek philosophy had played uh, in early Christian thought, particularly the doctrine of the Trinity, the two natures of Christ, and so on. And I've mentioned to you before that to talk about one substance, God as one substance and three persons, uh, that is a uh, uh, those, that terminology is based on Greek philosophy. Same when you say that uh, Jesus is one person with two natures. The vocabulary of person and nature is taken also from Greek philosophy. Uh, Harnack is uh, impressed that uh, uh, this is a distortion uh, of the original teaching of Jesus. Jesus was much more simple than this, and these philosophical ideas are ideas that came later on uh, from uh, uh, followers of uh, Christ, and they have no part of Jesus' original teaching. So we got to get rid of the influence of Greek philosophy. We've got to get rid of metaphysics. We've got to get rid of these uh, assertions uh, about, for example, the deity of Christ and so on. Now, what is Christianity? What is the essence of Christianity? To uh, ask the question that comes from the title of Harnack's book. Uh, well, he says the genius of Protestantism is to reduce theology to its basics uh, against the complications of the philosophical theologies. So uh, Harnack, I think I said Hermann there under number one, you can change that. Harnack, according to Harnack, uh, you can reduce the teachings of the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, particularly the teachings of Jesus. Uh, Harnack was a red-letter Christian. He was more interested in what uh, Jesus said because he thought that uh, with Paul and, and uh, other writers of the New Testament, you, you tend to get more metaphysical. You tend to get more philosophical. Anyway, here's Jesus' message. Three points, three simple points. One, the kingdom of God and its coming. Two, the Father of God and the infinite value of the human soul. Three, the higher righteousness and the commandment of love. So these are the things that Jesus brought into the world. This is how Jesus is different from the prophets of the Old Testament. This is how the teaching of Jesus is different from the other great religions of the world. Uh, he taught that the kingdom of God is coming. He taught the fatherhood of God and the infinite value of the human soul. And he taught the higher righteousness and the commandment of love. Um, you know, don't uh, take vengeance. Don't, uh, if your enemy hits you on one cheek, give him the other one. Uh, uh, don't uh, fight back. Uh, what does Harnack say about God? Well, the gospel proclaimed by Jesus, and that's what we ought to be interested in, not a philosophical concept of God. The gospel proclaimed by Jesus concerns only the Father, not the Son. Uh, so uh, we should not worship the Son as God. We should only worship the Father as God. That was what Jesus taught us. So the very important to, to all these older liberals is Jesus the teacher. Uh, Jesus' most important work for us is to teach us. Uh, they tended to play down the crucifixion, the atonement, the resurrection, and so on. But Jesus' teachings and Jesus' example are tremendously important for us. So the gospel of Jesus uh, concerns only the Father, not the Son. Number two, all men are children of God. Uh, God is the Father. Who is he Father of? Well, he's Father of all of us. <laughs> the New Testament distinguishes between uh, some who are children of God and some who are children of the devil. Uh, Harnack doesn't do that. Harnack uh, uh, prefers uh, universalism, uh, uh, universal fatherhood of God, and therefore universal brotherhood of man. You sometimes heard the older liberalism described that way, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Uh, that's uh, uh, <clears throat> very much the view of Harnack. 
What about Christ? Well, Jesus is not the object of our faith. He's not the one that we worship. And here, you know, Harnack is even a little skeptical of, of what Hermann emphasized. Hermann uh, said that uh, Jesus in his inner life was uh, kind of worthy of our worship, but Harnack wasn't willing to say that. Uh, what is important about Jesus is his teachings. He's the first to bring the gospel to light, and the gospel uh, is uh, the three propositions that we mentioned a moment ago. Jesus' pure spirituality, his filial piety, show us how to be true sons of God. So Jesus' uh, teaching and Jesus' example, all right, his example of True spirituality, uh, filial piety, of course, is, is uh, willingness to be uh, uh, to do the Father's will. Um, Harnack is uh, he, he dissociates the concept of messiahship from its external and legal uh, associations. He doesn't like law. He doesn't like to say that we're under law. Uh, ritual, of course, is against that too. And there's a little bit of, uh, I think, prejudice against Judaism here. Remember, uh, Harnack uh, is uh, uh, carrying on his work uh, about the time that Hitler was uh, on the path to gaining power. There's a lot of anti-Semitism in Germany at that time, and, and Harnack perhaps buys into that a little bit. He wants to uh, de-emphasize the Jewish background of the gospel. Uh, Jesus uh, ontologically is a mere man, but he serves as an important example for us. Uh, the resurrection, well, we don't know what happened, but uh, the resurrection, as, as Ritual and Hermann taught, uh, the resurrection uh, is some kind of an event, some kind of happening, uh, which revolutionized the faith of the disciples. And... Uh, uh, the disciples became convinced that Jesus had gained a victory uh, over, over death. Um, more of the teaching of the gospel, according to Hermann, uh, the scriptures uh, teach us the dichotomy between living in the spirit and living in the flesh, and of course living in the spirit for Hermann is following these three uh, propositions of the gospel, uh, dichotomy between God and the world, good and evil, soul and world, uh, and he's trying to gain a unity that's prior to these disunities. Uh, we are uh, beings who ought to be seeking to use nature for spiritual ends, uh, as Ritchell taught us, so we should not serve the things that are visible the things that are external, the things that are transient. Well, uh, this is really not too different from ritual, although it's something of a simplified form of Ritualianism. It's a kind of bridge between ritual and Bultmann. Now I want to talk about Soren Kierkegaard, uh, which brings us into a rather different world, okay? <laughs> Well, there's some parallels between uh, Kierkegaard and the Richlians, but he's not a Richlian. And he's even, I'm even dealing with him out of chronological order. Uh, Harnack, I mentioned, uh, died in 1930. Uh, Kierkegaard, you see his dates, uh, 1813 to 1855. So he is mid-19th century. So I'm going way back in time to reach Kierkegaard. Why do I do that? Well, because Kierkegaard uh, really didn't have a whole lot of influence in his own day, but he came to have influence much later. He came to have influence in the 20th century when people really started to read his books seriously. And he had a tremendous influence upon uh, uh, neo-Orthodox theologians like Barth and uh, Bultmann and Bruner. And he also had a tremendous influence on secular philosophers in the 20th century, people like uh, uh, Heidegger and uh, Sartre. So uh, we'll, we'll 
I, I'm trying to uh, uh, deal with Kierkegaard in a context which uh, eventually will bring him fairly close to these 20th century developments. Um, Kierkegaard, tremendously important thinker, uh, uh, his writings were probably the most important factor for uh, motivating people to move beyond Ritzleyanism, okay? Uh, Bart and Bultmann came along later, and they read Kierkegaard, and because they read Kierkegaard, they, they moved away uh, from their teachers, who were Ritzel and Hermann and Harnack. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, Bart had a love-hate relationship with Kierkegaard. His uh, early works were very Kierkegaardian, and then later on he said he was moving away from Kierkegaard, but uh, scholars debate whether he actually did or not. Number three on page 77, Kierkegaard also had much influence upon secular philosophers, the existentialists, as I mentioned. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, the language analyst, uh, read Kierkegaard before it became fashionable to do so. And uh, this may, uh, I may be able to point out to you some uh, aspects of Wittgenstein's thought later on uh, in which uh, I think he may have uh, been influenced by Kierkegaard. So, uh, but at any rate, uh, it's hard to classify Kierkegaard. Uh, he's not really, you know, I mean, I'm tempted to try to integrate him with this this movement called liberal theology, and he's really not. I mean, his whole mentality is different from that. He shares some beliefs with the liberals and, and with Bart later on, but he's really an, an individual, and, and he would have been happy for me to say that about him. He, he doesn't have any, uh, any close connections. Uh, uh, he doesn't have any close predecessors, and he doesn't have any close followers. Uh, he's really an individual. I, I think most of his theology is evangelical. Uh, most of what he says I, I respond to uh, positively. But there are some little quirks about uh, Kierkegaard that uh, uh, we perhaps need to give some attention to. Very interesting biography uh, you see under personal problems there, B background, one personal problems. His major concern is how do I become a Christian within Christendom, all right? Kierkegaard is uh, a Dane, and he uh, attends the Lutheran State Church of Denmark. And in the Lutheran State Church, at least this is Kierkegaard's uh, evaluation of it, people seem to be engaged in nominal Christianity, Christianity that is without passion. They get buried, they get baptized in the church, they get uh, married in the church, they get buried in the church lot. Uh, some of them at least attend church uh, because they're told to do so, because that's the custom in, in Denmark. But uh, few of them have any, any passion for Jesus Christ. But But look, if if Jesus is the Lord, if Jesus is the, uh, is the creator, if Jesus is the redeemer from sin, certainly uh, our, our relationship to him should be the most important relationship that we have. And we should be passionate in our devotion to Christ and our, our devotion to, to bring about uh, uh, in, in society uh, the, the, the changes that Jesus wanted to bring about. Well, uh, so wh what is going on here? I mean, why is it that uh, people can uh, be surrounded by Christianity, uh, by all these trappings of religion, and yet they have no meaningful relationship to Christ? And this is what Kierkegaard is wrestling with in all his book, many books and in all of his uh, uh, type of uh, uh, thinking. Now, some, some people... Uh, tried to say that uh, we should transform. The, the way to make uh, Christianity really cogent 
is to present it in a, in a uh, <coughs> respectable philosophical form. And the respectable philosophy in uh, Kierkegaard's day was Hegelian idealism. So we find a way, and, and Hegel did this himself, uh, find a way to integrate the gospel uh, into the Hegelian triads. And, and therefore you see the gospel as, as uh, containing symbols and philosophy that uh, give you great insight into the world. And isn't that something that you can be excited about? Well, Kierkegaard says no. Uh, reducing Christianity to a philosophical system is just the worst thing that you can do. And so uh, uh, Kierkegaard is, is highly, uh, uh, highly opposed to this philosophical approach. He's very well educated, but uh, he does not write in an academic style. Uh, he writes very personal observations about his own life, about uh, the culture around him, about the decisions that people make. Uh, he wrote uh, using pseudonyms. He, he uh, admires uh, Socrates, and uh, of course uh, in the Socratic dialogues you have Socrates discussing things with, uh, with other people. And uh, so Kierkegaard tries to create uh, dialogues like this in his own writings and uh, by putting different views up against one another. And one way he did that was to uh, uh, create different characters that he would give different names to, Johannes Climacus and uh, so on. Uh, and uh, he would, he would uh, use those as, as pseudonyms. He would write a book and... Uh, say that the author was Johannes Climacus, uh, well, uh, is he presenting Kierkegaard's views or is he presenting uh, an alternative view that he wants us to consider? Is this Kierkegaard speaking or is this Climacus speaking? And often he didn't tell us, you know, he just uh, let us kind of figure it out with the idea that somehow if you uh, think about this view and if you think about that view, maybe you'll come to understand uh, something of the issues. Uh, and, and this is the alternative to uh, doing what the Hegelians did, trying to reduce everything to a system. Here you have no system. You just have a, a lot of miscellaneous voices presenting their positions, into interacting with one another. Uh, so there is no system. This is what uh, Kierkegaard called uh, indirect communication. It's one form of indirect communication, and we want to get, get at that uh, in a little bit. Kierkegaard uh, uh, opposed the idea of a theological or philosophical system. Uh, he uh, uh, believed that abstract concepts cannot adequately describe individual existence, and that's the important thing, you see. How can I become a Christian within Christendom? Not by understanding some abstract or general uh, <clears throat> concepts. That's the philosophical prejudice, isn't it? That's what uh, Plato told us to do, to think about the forms, to think about the general nature of things. Kierkegaard says, no, what we need to do is to understand the individual, to understand the nature of individual choice, individual decision. And uh, so this is, uh, so abstract concepts cannot tell you how to develop a vital relationship with Christ. Only an understanding of, of human decision is going to do that. I mean, you, you need to make a decision. You need to have a personal relationship with Christ. And so if we're going to talk about anything, if we're going to study anything, it's got to be a study of individuals, of, of individual personal relationships. Arguments, propositional knowledge, never in themselves force one to choose or force one to act. Uh, arguments are in propositional, are in hypothetical form, if P then Q. They yield a conclusion only if the premise is accepted, but accepting the premise requires a free decision. And once you reach the conclusion, 
you need to make another free decision, namely to act upon the uh, decision that you've made. This decision and this action is what is most important to human nature. It's not like the, you know, the Greeks tried to define what a human being is. Uh, Aristotle said that human beings are rational animals. Well, what does that tell us? It tells us that we should live according to reason and so on and so forth. Kierkegaard doesn't think that's helpful. Uh, uh, Kierkegaard thinks that what's distinctive to human nature is uh, the decisions that we make, what we make of our lives, not what we are, not our essence, if you will, but our existence, our choices, our decisions. And therefore, abstract concepts are very limited in value. So what we need is a concrete description of the nature of decision. That's difficult to convey in words, which by their nature are somewhat abstract. Indirect communication seeks, without abstract description, to give one a sense of how this takes place. So again, the different voices, the pseudonyms, the uh, different views being put over against one another, showing why one author made this choice and another person made this choice and somebody else chose to think this way and so on. This is the indirect communication of Kierkegaard. And he thinks there are additional reasons why the Christian faith as a human decision. You know, you gotta, I don't care how Calvinistic you are, <laughs> you've got to decide to put your faith in Jesus. Uh, um, choose you this day whom you must serve. Uh, don't, don't be the kind of Calvinist who says we don't make decisions. Uh, be the kind of Calvinist that says, yeah, the Lord uh, foreordains them, but we got to do them, okay? And uh, Kierkegaard is right, I think, in saying, yes, we, we do need to make a decision uh, to uh, be friends with Jesus rather than uh, the devil. Uh, so, uh, the Christian faith cannot be conveyed through the communication of abstract concepts. You've got to uh, uh, come up with a, a way of understanding uh, human decisions. Well, I, I could belabor this on and on and on. Just about everything Kierkegaard wrote uh, was about this. Uh, people kind of, kind of tr find it difficult to uh, find a continuing theme in Kierkegaard's writings. So this is it. Uh, he's trying to show uh, what it's like to make uh, decisions for Christ. The preceding program has been brought to you by RTS on iTunes U and may not be reproduced or disseminated in part or in whole for sale or for profit without express written consent. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920.